Good day YouTube, my name is Dan and welcome to another episode of CryptoLite. Today, I'm very excited to talk to you about the Internet of Service project or better known as the IOS token or simply IOS. Scalability is one of the big buzzwords in cryptocurrency. Scalability represents how well a blockchain project is able to scale as the business grows. Ethereum's theoretical speed is actually 1000 transactions per second, but practically Ethereum only functions at 16 transactions per second. This is because Ethereum is not scalable. There have been many theoretical scaling solutions, examples sharding, lightning, radon, plasma, that have been proposed over time. However, we are now reaching a very exciting time in crypto history where many of these scaling solutions that have just been concepts for years are finally starting to be integrated into real projects on a level that can help them to achieve transaction speeds previously unheard of. IOS is one such project that aims to use sharding to achieve transaction speeds of up to 100,000 transactions per second. This would make IOS easily one of the fastest platforms in the world. To learn more about IOS and their groundbreaking technology, keep watching this video. IOS describes itself as a secure and scalable blockchain for smart services. The Internet of Services offers a secure and scalable infrastructure for online service providers. Its high TPS, scalable and secure blockchain and privacy protection provide infinite possibilities for online service providers to serve their customer base. In layman terms, iOS is basically a blockchain platform. It's a platform on which other blockchain projects or dApps decentralized apps are built on. A blockchain is basically a store of data or, or information. It's the world's safest way of storing data and it achieves this through the process of decentralization. Decentralization is spreading the processing of data across thousands of nodes rather than a single point of contact which can be hacked or corrupt. All these thousands of nodes then will check with each other and come to a consensus before storing the information on the blockchain. Every node has a copy of the information because the node is the, sorry because the information is stored on thousands of nodes. To change one transaction copy, you literally have to change all the information on all the nodes at exactly the same moment, which is simply impossible. Thus, the blockchain is supposedly unhackable and untemperable. But the limitation of the blockchain is that with the above model, it only works with small volumes. When the data that you are processing and storing grows from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes and petabytes and beyond, attempting to process and store every piece of information on every single node results in an extremely slow throughput or movement of data through the blockchain. To solve this problem, iOS uses a process called sharding to speed things up. Sharding is essentially splitting all the available nodes up to smaller groups of equal number of nodes and getting each of these groups of nodes or shards to process or validate and store different bits of data. So instead of having one system validating data, I now have like a thousand systems or shards processing the data. This speeds the entire systems up over a thousand fold. But more than that, it's sustainable, meaning that as the system grows, the processing power and speed actually gets quicker and faster faster rather than slowing down because the more nodes you have, the more shards you have to do the work. This is scalability. Now, iOS is not the only project using sharding. There are a few other projects, only a few, example Zilliqa, whom we have done a review for as well, who uses sharding as well. There are not many projects that can successfully implement any sort of scaling solution at this point in crypto history. And in my opinion, any of them that can do so are worth paying attention to. Every project that uses sharding is using the same concept of partitioning the data. But what makes each sharding project different or unique is the way in which they implement sharding. iOS have called their sharding method the efficient distributed sharding. To the best of my understanding, there are four features that make this project unique as a sharding program. The first is what we call a trans epoch. A trans epoch is basically a node to shard assignment protocol. So where in some sharding schemes, the sharding scheme itself is static, meaning that the nodes groups don't change. But in iOS, they use a dynamic rolling scheme where the nodes are swapped in and out in batches. So the nodes in each shard is never the same forever. 
And this improves the security of the system, which is a very big thing for sharding because the biggest disadvantage or danger of using sharding is that when you use a shard and not all the nodes to verify a transaction, theoretically, you lower the security of the whole system. That means it's easier to form a backdoor hack through a small shard than to try and hack the entire system. So having a dynamic rolling scheme where you keep changing the nodes in and out really helps with the security feature. The second feature that they have is not only are the nodes swapped in and out, they are also picked by random to reduce the chance or impact of any malicious nodes having an impact on the whole system. The third feature they have is what is called Atomics. Atomics, for those who are familiar with computer science, is basically an atomic commitment protocol. Uh, in the simple way of explaining it, this is basically a way of transmitting data across shards instantaneously. So if I have 1,000 shards, I have to come up with some sort of technology to move information between those 1,000 shards efficiently and quickly. And for them, that's the atomic commit protocol. In addition, they also have some additional security features, example, a two-tier verification to make the transactions both safe and fast. The fourth unique feature about their sharding method is the way they store the data. Now, iOS uses a technology that's called microstate blocks to store data. Think of this simply as a summary of the transactions. So the system will set up checkpoints and at those checkpoints, a snapshot or summary will be taken. So if a new node was to join the pool or if a node was to recover from a crash, rather than having to download the entire history of the blockchain, is what, which is what traditional systems nodes have to do, and now the new nodes in iOS can simply take a copy of the summary. This saves a lot of time and effort. Currently in testnet, their speed is 8,000 transactions per second, which is already a lot faster than most platforms out there. The average speed for the new generation platforms currently is about 1,000 to 2,500 transactions per second. It is estimated for iOS that by this year, they should achieve speeds in the tens of thousands. So we're talking 30,000, 40,000. And the maximum transaction speed by the team estimated is 100,000 transaction seconds when mainnet is launched. And 100,000 transactions per second will easily make it one of the fastest platforms in the market. Now, besides the EDS or their sharding system, the other key feature of the iOS tech is their consensus algorithm, which is called Proof of Deliverability or POB. The, co the oldest consensus algorithm in blockchain is called proof of work and that's the consensus algorithm that Bitcoin uses. It's not used very much these days because it's not very efficient and it also uses too much electricity. These days, the most popular consensus algorithm would be proof of stake or delegated proof of stake, DPOS. Now the weakness with proof of stake is that those who have a lot of coins to stake can earn more and as a result there is an infinite earnings by those who are rich and then they can use their earnings to stake even more and then earn more and stake more again. The, the entire consensus um, system then becomes monopolized or centralized around a few rich people. DPoS or Delegated Proof of Stake is a modification of POS and tries to solve this centralized problem by doing a introducing a voting system. So the master nodes are voted by the community and the master nodes can also be voted out by the community. However, the difficulty with DPoS at the moment is that there are a set number of super nodes. So in some cases, some projects that use DPoS, they have less than five super nodes. So then these stake pools, which are very limited in number, okay, the stake pools are where the smaller token holders like you and me will join, but the stake pools themselves end up becoming the centralized point of these consensus. Now, proof of believability attempts to solve the weaknesses of proof of stake as well as um, the POS. Now, POB or proof of believability in construct is actually very similar to proof of stake and delegated proof of stake. However, instead of using uh, the pure amount of tokens or the voting power to select which nodes can participate, proof of believability tries to ensure fairness by using something that is called the believability mechanism. This is how it works. 
all nodes are divided into two groups. There is the believable leak and the normal leak. Believable validators process transactions quickly in the first phase, and then the normal validators sample and verify the transactions in the second phase to provide finality and ensure verifiability. This means that the entire um, process does not go through only a single node, but it is checked and validated to prevent malicious activities. The chance of a node being elected into the believable league, which is something like a semi-master node, you can think of it, is based on the believability score, which is calculated by a complex algorithm, which includes various factors like your contribution to the systems, the tokens you hold, etc. There is also a punishment system, where if the normal nodes detect any inconsistency in data, the culprit believable node will lose all his tokens and reputation. So this is a very harsh punishment, but it is specifically set to strongly discourage misbehavior. You would basically have to be intentionally trying to sabotage or hack the system to warrant this punishment. Now let's talk a bit about their token use. With any platform project as token investors, we are not really investing in the shares of the company as we would be if we bought the shares of the company on the share market. The difference between buying shares on the share market versus buying tokens in the crypto market is that a shareholder owns an actual share of the company and what the shareholder is investing in is really the actual value of the company. As a token holder, when we are investing by buying a token, what we are actually investing in is not the value of the company, but the value of the token. Now, usually the two, the value of the company and the value of the token are related. So to have a good token value, you must also have a successful company. But it's not necessarily the same vice versa, meaning you could have a great company, but if there isn't any token mechanics, i.e. there isn't any token use, then the company can be successful and earning a lot of money through its technology, but the token price actually stays stagnant and doesn't rise. So crypto is a form of currency, and for any currency value to rise, the currency must be used, it must be in demand. The more currency is being used, the higher the demand, the higher the value of the token. The less the currency is being used, the lower the value of the currency. So as token investors, token use is very important for us to consider and what you want to see with any project, especially platform projects, is you want to see a circle use of the token. What I mean by circle use is that there is an avenue for money to come in but also an avenue for the money or the tokens to go out and then the economy becomes sustainable because it becomes like a circle. What comes in goes out and then it will come in again and it will go out again. And if you see a project where there is only money going in one direction, either coming in or only going out, then the token economy then is a bubble and is going to burst at some point, example a Ponzi scheme. In this case, iOS actually has a very healthy token mechanic setup. Not only does it have one way or two ways of coming in, it has three ways of coming in and three ways of going out iOS is basically a service centric model. Okay, so they focus on scalability and high performance, meaning they are aiming for very big companies. They are not aiming for single users like you and me individuals to use the platform. They are aiming for very, very big companies to use the platform. To give you an example, Visa, one of the fastest transaction speeds in the world, has a system that hosts 45,000 transactions per second. This is probably one of the fastest systems in the entire world. So a lot of smaller blockchain projects that are currently functioning at only one to 2,000 transactions per second who cannot be used by Visa. So iOS then, aiming to produce 1,000 transactions per second is aiming to be used by these, uh, the biggest companies in the world, basically by Google, Amazon, Visa, etc. Now, users can gain iOS tokens through three means. One, you could serve the system by validating the blocks. You can do community services. Community services will include anything like contributing resources or contributing storage space, etc. Or you could simply buy the iOS token from an exchange. In in terms of output, the iOS tokens that a user has can be used for three things. One, it can be used for payments, it can be used for commissions to validators, and thirdly, it can be used as a believability score uh, reference. So yeah, the amount of tokens you have do, does affect your believability score to some degree. 
So it's basically a very healthy, um, sustainable economy with lots of input and lots of output. Now, something I noticed in their white paper, which I've not seen in any other review, is the mention that they will have a second token that is known as a survey token. A survey token is a token that is designed to encourage members to contribute to the continued development of the iOS community. It is firstly non-tradable, so you cannot buy this from the exchanges. Secondly, you can only earn this by giving contributions to the project. And number three it is actually self-destructive, meaning that it will destroy itself after validating a block. So what's the point of a survey token then? Having a survey token, if you earn service tokens by um, serving the community essentially you will you, you will boost up your believability score so then you are more likely to be chosen as a believable node i think that a better way to look at survey rather than a currency is to look at it more like a score system so what it ensures is that the believability score of any user is dynamic so just because you contributed a lot to the ios project once doesn't mean that your believability score will always be high and you will always be the top node because the actual survey token will be destroyed after validating a node so it ensures that if someone wants their node to keep being a top earning node that person has to keep contributing to the system this is a very clever system that i haven't seen in terms of the economics of the blockchain space before but it makes a whole lot of sense the last thing to mention about the token, and this is more a piece of news rather than token mechanics. About three days ago, the team released an announcement that they will be locking the tokens reserved for the foundation. So the tokens reserved for the company. And this equals 35%, just over a third of the total supply of the tokens. The tokens will be kept or stored in a public wallet, which can be monitored at any time by the public. And the wallet address was put up on the article itself. So I think that locking up 35% of the tokens is going to be very attractive to investors because it means two things. Firstly, it means that there's going to be stability to the price point. There isn't going to be a sudden dump. But it also means that there's a lot of confidence by the team themselves in the project. Because by locking in the tokens, the team is saying that they cannot bail out even if the project crashes. If the project was to fail and hit ground zero, the team are going to go bankrupt because they cannot actually sell the tokens. Also, when we talk that the team is locking the tokens in onto mainnet, okay, a lot of platforms or popular platforms at the moment, the mainnet is going to be launched in third quarter, fourth quarter. So we're talking a couple of months away. But with iOS, as we will see in their roadmap later, um, their mainnet is only going to be launched over one year later. So this is a very big commitment by the team. And you've got to be very confident in the project to uh, do such an announcement. The team is not the only ones with confidence in the project. If you look at their sponsors, there are a lot of capital firms in the list. These are names whom you will recognize, Sequoia, Denhua Capital, Ling BC, Nirvana Capital, Zen Fund, even UOB. A lot of these names are investors companies that we've come across in previous reviews and they have very good investment portfolios and they tend to pick the winning upcoming blockchain projects. So if even one or two of these investors have um, iOS in their portfolio, that alone would inspire a lot of confidence. But here you have so many capital firms investing in them. I think this is probably the most capital firms investments I've seen in a blockchain project so far. So personally for me, this one page itself inspires more confidence in me than any or all the YouTube positive reviews I've read or heard. You see, I follow crypto YouTubers and have a lot of respect for crypto YouTubers, including myself. <laughs> but for many of the crypto YouTubers, we are not professionals. But these capital investment firms, they are all highly trained professionals who are very selective in the projects that they choose. The fact that many of them are seeing something worthwhile to invest into iOS, that has got to carry some weight. This is their team. As you can see, it's a really big sized team and this is only their core members. They also have a board of very qualified advisors. The thing I don't really like is how their profile pics are all cartoon pictures, but really they're not trying to hide anything. Because if you click on their LinkedIn profile, each of them have a full LinkedIn profile where you can check their entire um, history. They have a total of five co-founders. And because of time's sake, I won't go through each one of them, but uh, 
Overall, I would summarize the team's resume as a rather impressive team with very strong resumes from universities like Princeton, Harvard, John Hopkins, etc. They are also individual with awards, example the Gold Medal ACM Programming Contest. They are also individuals with experience in working in very big companies like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Microsoft, etc. Age-wise, they do seem a bit young, but uh, many of them, including their co-founder Jimmy Zong, has had very multiple successful startups career, including starting up a company worth over $100 million. Also in his live stream recently, Jimmy Zong mentioned that he and several of the co-founders are friends and they have worked together on previous projects as well. So it's reassuring to know that the team has successfully created and worked together on multi-million dollar projects before. This is their roadmap. It's a very good and clear roadmap with consistent goals spread out over every quarter and it runs to the end of 2019. The main take home I wanted to point out to you from the roadmap is that their official release of mainnet is only going to happen on the third quarter of 2019 and the depths are only officially launching in the fourth quarter of 2019. So basically this project is quite a long huddle until you see a working product. The long huddle in itself can be a double-edged sword. On one hand, they might miss the first mover's advantage, which is a huge thing in crypto, but on the other hand, it does give them the flexibilities to see what issues the quicker third-generation platforms are going to face, and then they can launch a more complete product. You see, platform products, you can't um, kind of modify it on the go, or it's a lot harder to modify it on the go. The reason why Ethereum cannot implement a scalability solution, even though it knows of it, is because Ethereum already has like 800 projects on its platform running. So to try and implement a solution on a working platform is like trying to tweak a car engine while the car is moving on the road. It is so much easier to modify the engine when the car is stationary in the workshop before you send it out. So in that sense, it, the, the long uh, huddle may actually turn out in the favor of the project. As long as the wait is not too long, in this case, it's not too long, it's not unreasonable. Uh, and also more importantly, when we look at a roadmap like this, what we want to see is that the team is setting consistent goals and they are working so that there is no gap where the team is seemingly doing nothing. So this is overall a good roadmap. Now, one small consideration I have just before we round up with a price prediction, but the small consideration I have is that uh, after looking at the white paper as well as asking on their social media, I couldn't find a satisfactory answer regarding the security around civil resistance. So the other only good scaling platform using sharding that I know of at the moment is Zilliqa. And Zilliqa includes something in their uh, protocol called a civil resistance, which is basically a protection against a very specific type of attack. So this is not a negative point against iOS. I'm sure that perhaps they do address this, but I just couldn't find the answer anywhere. Uh, in fact, I will give a shout out to the Telegram community. A lot of what I presented about the tech um, came from the Telegram information yesterday. I was there for over half an hour shooting out tech questions and over, I think it was three of their admins actually took time to patiently answer all my questions and the community members chipped in and were very helpful as well. The community had uh, 39,000 um, people on the Telegram chat, so that's a lot of people. But despite the volume of the chat that was going on, they actually took time to um, just answer uh, my questions, a single user's questions, which I thought was very outstanding. So it's really the most helpful Telegram community I've come across and I just want to say a big thank you to them. So if anyone uh, who's watching this video has an answer to whether or not they have addressed the Sybil attack question, uh, please post a reply in the comments below so that others can also see the answer. All right, finally, rounding up with a price prediction. When iOS hit the exchanges back in January, they opened at 2.2 cents. And since then, uh, shortly after that rather, they had the Binance listing and they saw this massive spike in price and they jumped up to 12 cents. The spike here was really from the Binance listing. It was not the big price jump that we see in other tokens that came in the early few days of January. 
the, that bull run that the general market had at the start of January, many altcoins went up 20 to 50 x gains. Okay, um, that's not the gains that iOS saw. iOS has not seen a bull run yet. Okay, all they saw was a momentary spike when it was listed on Binance. So you can only imagine what will happen when iOS does hit its first bull run, which we are all hoping is going to happen soon. Looking at the general market, currently they are sitting at 3.6 cents. If you look at the graph on the whole, this is a pretty low price point to get into uh, iOS despite the recent green market. If they were ever to get back to their all time high, that would be almost instantly a 4x gain. And it's not that hard to believe or imagine that they will get back to their all time high because, as I said before, their all time high isn't even that high. It wasn't a bull run high, it was only a spike from being listed on Binance. So I am confident that iOS will get to their all-time high sometime this year. In terms of longer-term predictions, as we always say, platform projects currently are very lucrative investments because they will provide stable incomes from projects and all future blockchain dApps have to be built on a platform. So it's a lot of business. And also, if you are one of the first projects to successfully implement a scalability solution like sharding, you instantly become attractive to new users. So from my point of view, iOS is a very easy project to believe in because you have the team showing a lot of confidence by locking in their tokens. You've got capital investments showing a lot of confidence in it. And you have the market in general showing confidence in them with a ranking of number 54 on the market despite being a very young coin. The community is also very big and they have a lot of momentum as a project. So personally, I'm thinking for myself that iOS is a pretty good investment. But hey, I'm not a professional and this is not financial advice. I'm just sharing my thoughts on my own crypto journey with you. So please always do your own research and make your own decisions. All right, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Drop us a comment to let us know what you think of iOS or this video. If you like this video and if you found it helpful, do give us a like and subscribe to help us to grow as a channel. Do also check out our very own crypto telegram chat. It's less than a week old and the link is in the description box below. We currently have a very small but awesome community with lots of interesting updates and conversations so do drop in and say hi. Otherwise have an awesome day wherever you are and we will catch you next time.